Warriors. Giver of life and light. In your divine radiance, we trust. Shield our souls with grace, our hearts with hope. Arm us with your golden splendor. In light, we walk. Faith. A bastion of respite for those worn by Mornstead's harrowing landscape and broken kingdom. It offers a glimmer of hope and salvation from the clutches of darkness. Religion is a source of protection for the mortal and manipulation for the immortal, as gods assert their will to destroy one another through loyal supplicants. The demon god Adir, master of conflagrant pyromancy, liege to the fallen Rogar lords and imprisoned exile from ages past, dominates through corrupting fire. His demonic legions and cultist worshippers have sundered Mornstead. Beyond, in Umbral's chilling realm, the putrid mother hungers for the warmth of the living and through her agents seeks to consume all life to satisfy a ravenous greed. But what of the divine god Aureus, embodiment of radiant light, deity of the hallowed sentinels and those sworn to holy justice? Aureus, though mentioned in texts and tomes, is himself missing from the conflict that consumes Mornstead. Who is this enigmatic and inscrutable god who wields lightning, blesses the righteous, and smites the guilty? What of his devoted adherents? This is the story of Aureus, the heavenly god of illumination, the foundation of his church, and the grim charge of the Dark Crusader Order to spread his gospel a warning that major lords of the fallen spoilers are to follow. All right, let's dive in. Gods and lords of the fallen are fickle and often spiteful. They share in the mortal emotions of fear, ambition, contempt, and they work assiduously to manifest their whims in the mortal realm. Lies espoused by dogmatic doctrine are used to obscure reality. No deity is truly benevolent. All envision selfish ends, and the hapless souls caught in the conflict between the divine are simply means to achieve such. Several gods can be found in varying degrees of veneration throughout the lands, each an embodiment of fundamental aspects of nature. Aureus, the god of radiance, is a divine shepherd and master of paradise meant to guide souls into the benevolent embrace of the heavens. He is the god of light, symbolic of illumination, of renewal and warmth, but also a source of sweltering judgment. Aureus is extolled as magnanimous and kind, a father figure who bestows largesse upon his children, but only to those in whom pure devotion glows. His mighty ire is cast upon all non-believers in torrents of destructive lightning. The mythos of Aureus holds that he is the divine creator, crafter of all beings and all that exists in the world. By his will and through his word, light and life were born. But such power demanded great sacrifice. His followers believe that Aureus surrendered his very being in the process of creation, a grim ritual wherein he decapitated himself and gave rise to the heavenly firmament, the sun, the moon, and cast illumination upon the world. This we hear passed down in the hidden lore of the Radiant Guardian spell, which produces a small orb of divine light that protects its caster. The text states that some Orians believe these orbs of radiant magic to be fragments of the first light brought into the universe by Aureus when he severed his own head and cast it into the sky, whereupon its brilliance transformed it into the sun. This is both a great act of charity and of self-sacrifice that demonstrates Aureus' willingness to provide for his mortal flock. But in the ring of sanguine might, we are enlightened to a more detailed account. Its hidden lore goes on to say that the significance of blood in most branches of Aurism stems from the belief that the drops of Aureus' blood, which scattered when he decapitated himself, became the moon, planets, and stars thus allowing him to be visibly present even in the night sky. And if we scrutinize the ring itself, we see the holy symbol of Aureus Church coated in rivulets of dried blood. This 
is the pivotal moment for Orism. This ritual act lays the foundation for idealistic pillars upon which the religion is built, including notions of sacrifice and penance, that through enduring hardship are great fruits earned, and the value placed on blood and other humors of the body. After this first act of creation, Aureus himself disappears. Perhaps it's that his mortal form was destroyed in his sacrifice, or that after building the heavens above, he left to reside in paradise. It could also hold that he was forcefully driven out eons ago, bested by another deity when the demon god Adir asserted his influence upon the realm. The god of Rogar may have witnessed Aureus weakened by the ritual and seized an opportunity to claim divine power for himself. After all, Adir becomes the great god of humanity in its ancient past, the lord whom they worship and to whom they are bound. But even though his presence lacks, the myth of Aureus is perpetuated and progenitor religions of Aurism are born. They venerate in secret the rightful god beaten back by the infernal Adir. Shrines are erected to honor him, which depict Aureus as a bearded and grave figure, whose head, peculiarly, still rests on its shoulders. A possible discrepancy in their belief over how he created the world and the heavens. The Orion Preacher Shield confirms both that Orism has deep and ancient roots in humanity's past, and that it exists in multiplex forms. A vast number of aureus based religions have existed during mankind's history, and though some of their beliefs and practices have varied wildly, most consider Aureus to be the omnipotent and benevolent source of all light and life in the world. Regardless, the fact remains that Aureus is thrown into obscurity's darkness during a deer's rise as a lord of humanity. Here, his faithful remain, persecuted by the demon god's adherents, vilified for their beliefs but adamant nonetheless. Then, roughly 1500 years before the current day, humankind is stirred to action. So long enslaved by a deer, so misguided in their worship, man declares war against the tyrant and demon god. Led in valiant battle by the three judges, demigods of significant ability and great renown, Mortals defy Adir's will, destroy his fallen Rogar lords, and banish the demon back to his fiery Rogar realm. A great hole expands within human spirituality in the war's wake. Mortals are left without an immortal shepherd. With no god to guide them and to promise salvation, humanity faces existential dread. This is likely the void in which Orism flourishes. Touted as the bringer of light and salvation, Aureus and his practices are widely accepted by people who've known only uncertainty for many years. Though many different sects of the religion evolve over time, there are foundational pillars of belief that unite all Orients. The first is faith in their lord Aureus and a steadfast commitment that they will worship no other god besides. Aurism is a monotheistic religion, which differs vastly from some of the more primitive cultures steeped in shamanistic ritual, such as that of the nomadic Uttarangrans. Orion preachers and priests admonish all heretics that venerate other deities within the pantheon of gods. The second is holy penance, a divine cleansing of the soul's sin through suffering. As Aureus suffered, so too must his flock to achieve exalted blessing. This we hear in the castigated armor tinct. In many branches of Orism, those followers who fall short of expectations are required to perform penance, relinquishing their pride and any elaborate or colorful garb before striving for forgiveness through righteous mortification. This usually involves a method of self-flagellation or self-harm, which leads to the third uniting pillar, the sanctity of blood. As Aureus bled to make the world and the heavens, so too must his children bleed to be worthy of his gift. Many are the martyrs who sacrifice themselves in God's name, and countless are the wounds suffered in liturgical blood rituals. 
To understand, on the rudimentary level, the nature of Aureus and the institutional pillars of his holy church, one need look no further than the catalog of spells cast in his name. Each god in Lords of the Fallen is patron deity of a particular form of sorcery, their divine essence manifest in the spells cast. Aureus is the patron of radiant sorcery. This is magic that harnesses his illuminating light. Those who invoke radiant sorcery use as catalysts books of scripture, blessed artifacts, and holy mementos affiliated with their god. It's in the casting of radiant sorcery that we are again enlightened to the significance of blood and sacrifice within orism. The caster must spill drops of their own blood to fuel spells of light, which are displayed mechanically in the buildup of the bleed status bar. Radiant spells mirror the charity that acts as a foundational ideal within the Church of Aureus. Clergy and priests bestow blessings to rejuvenate both body and soul. Holy orders seek out societies impoverished, infirm, and downtrodden, and perform acts of kind goodwill, imparting Aureus munificence. Such is the nature of many radiant sorceries which are used to convalesce, to ameliorate the sullen gloom of reality, and elevate those who have been worn by the world. This we see in the healing radiant sorcery, which replenishes health upon use. Its hidden lore reads, Followers of Aureus who utilize this sorcery believe that it not only mends damaged flesh and bones, but invigorates the recipient's soul with his divine light. In the healing sigil spell which casts a luminous symbol of the Orion Church that heals those nearby makes reference to the blessing felt by those in God's presence. Aureus worshippers who make hazardous journeys together as a group are often grateful for the relief this sorcery can collectively provide. Aureus adherents travel the realm founding abbeys, orphanages, infirmaries, and churches, which all act as bulwark against darkness, a haven of blessed respite where the whispers of their munificent god might be heard. The reality is that not all see the salvation offered by Aureus. Many turn their back to his light and consign themselves to damnation. Those who sin and commit reprehensible evil must be accordingly dealt with. As radiant sorcery is used to shield the less fortunate, so too is it wielded as a sword to smite transgressors. Many radiant spells endow their casters with aureus lightning, which pierces all defense and strikes with judgment the very souls of their enemies. Great acts of violence indeed have been perpetrated on Aureus' behalf, but to absolve themselves of the guilt attached to such morally questionable deeds, those of the church claim it is all done with a divine assent. This we hear in the hidden lore associated with the radiant weapon sorcery. When a faithful combatant wreathes their weapon in the divine light of Aureus, they become more assured than ever that the violence they are about to inflict is righteous. It can be seen now that the church utilizes both charity and conflict to spread Aureus' blessed word, but it also works in subtle and more insidious ways to ensure monotheistic primacy within the pantheon of gods. Through knowledge and its suppression, the church vaulted to even greater heights. Cultural purges and the ardent eradication of anything deemed unorthodox or heretical goes far to stamp out deviant thought at the source. Such was the case with the warrior nomads of Uderanger who settled in Mornstead. They lived in ritual shamanism and worshipped gods other than divine Aureus, something the church couldn't countenance. The events of their brutal assaults on these transgressors is relayed in the hidden lore of the Ruck Rune. Long ago, the Church of Orion Radiance officially condemned the people of Uderanger and their gods and tasked the Dark Crusaders with launching a crusade into the vast, harsh land in order to bring it into Aureus light and under church control. It's not only external deviance the Orion Church seeks to suppress, but also any internal thought conflicting with church doctrine and the teachings of Aureus. Admonishment is passed with a heavy hand upon those members deemed radical for pursuing heretical knowledge. 
Penitents are made to suffer through castigation and extrication of sin until their minds are humbled, their thoughts pruned, their souls checked into submission. There are several mentions of the church dealing gravely with deviants and of their fear of knowledge in general, for insight brings with it scrutiny of Aureus. Both the Oroman rune and the Orion sorcerer's ring make passing reference to secret or hidden knowledge. The latter states that the master smith who crafted it was deemed a vagabond hunted by the Church of Orion Radiance for his knowledge, while the former hints at why insight is so strongly feared by the church clergy. I have learned that truth can be found within both darkness and light. The former merely requires more application. Truth is often an enemy of faith, and the Orient Church assiduously censors information to ensure a devout and acquiescent following. Censorship of information behind a plausible cry of heresy is crucial for the Orient religion to suppress truths difficult to swallow. The connections between Orism and the beliefs of Rogar worshippers are stronger than many would care to admit, and these religions have varying degrees of overlap in the ceremonies they perform and the ideals to which they strive. A clue as to how familiar Adir and Aureus are to one another is hinted at in the hidden lore of the Nartun rune. The exact nature of mana is very rarely studied by the Church of Orion Radiance, for the idea that impious magic such as the infernal sorceries of the Rogar, might share some fundamental connection with the blessed gift of radiance, is heretical indeed. Exactors, theologians, and professors ensure the masses are taught only the dogma of the church in attempt to curb subversive thoughts and progress. Beyond the examples of church belief found within radiant spells, there exists the codices of eternal radiance. These books of holy scripture document the history of Orism, the divinity of their god, and the mission of his church on earth. Excerpts from the Codex are used to invigorate the spirit in trying times, and to solidify conviction within his followers. Three volumes can be found throughout Mornstead, their excerpts enlightening us to church beliefs. As the sun travels across the sky each day, so too does Aureus watch over us each day of our lives. We are born in his light, and in his light we die. As Aureus' mercy descends upon the righteous hearts of the faithful, so too does his judgment strike down upon the sinful hearts of the wicked. Any and all afflictions shall be washed away by Aureus' divine light, the flesh reborn, the spirit renewed. Like most religions, various sects of Orism have appeared throughout history. One of the earliest was that of the Descriers of the Dawn, who invested themselves within the nascent kingdom of Mornstead. The Descriers of the Dawn were Mornstead's preeminent religious institution for centuries, intent in the studying of sunrises, sunsets, and stars. Their interest in celestial bodies harkens to the foundational belief of Aureus' heavenly sacrifice, to create the firmament. The Descriers acted as spiritual guides for Mornstead's noble families, their primary duty being to properly prepare the corpses of royals and nobles for entombment within Skyrest Bridge, and assist the departing souls in their ascension into the light of Aureus. Their significance in Skyrest Bridge is apparent when endeavoring the crypts beneath, wherein their armor set lies. According to Pieta, she of blessed renewal, the Descriers were misguided, holding ancient beliefs and superstitions that conflict with later church doctrine. She divulges as much in conversation. The Descriers of the Dawn were misguided, harboring fundamental misinterpretations of Aureus's divine will and works. Many of the Mornstead nobles entombed in this crypt followed their teachings, believing it was the light of Aureus, not its stonework which maintained this great structure. And yet, despite their ignorance, Aureus has allowed the bridge to stand. Is that not a sign of his benevolence? 
the Descriers, are brutally expelled from Mornstead and supplanted as the kingdom's dominant religion with the arrival of Judge Cleric and the Hallowed Sentinels. None among the Descriers foresaw the grim future which the coming of the Hallowed Sentinels would bring about. The Sentinels raise Descrier churches, plunder stores, and confiscate land. We see their expulsion from Mornstead within this stigma outside the Abbey of the Hallowed Sisters. And any Descrier of the Dawn found trespassing will be severely punished for their transgression. This place is now sanctified in the name of Judge Cleric, and no longer a sanctuary for the ignorant and misguided. Please. This has been our own for generations. We've always kept our hearts open to the Hallowed Sentinels. Be grateful that by Judge Cleric's mercy, you are allowed to leave with those wayward hearts still beating. Repent, and turn to her for salvation. And the final fate of this Orion religion, sealed in the Dawnblade armor tinct. The Dawnblades were a short-lived, more martial splinter group consisting of former members of the Descriers of the Dawn. Departing Mornstead, the Dawnblades undertook a journey to Bregal, only to never return from that cursed land. Lost to Time is an ancient sect of Orism whose practices have long since faded to myth. Only one artifact remains to detail their radical beliefs, a pendant covered in rust and blood found within the Tower of Penance. The Pendant of the Blood Sun, crafted from old metal, possesses a thirst for blood that fuels radiant magic. The life essence of enemies slakes its thirst and charges Orion sorcery used by its bearer, hinting at this sect's brutal ways. The hidden lore reads, One particularly severe and ancient branch of Orism preaches that one day, Orius' final judgment of all beings will be signaled by the sun bursting and unleashing an immense tide of blood. A grim and foreboding omen. If one takes the time to look skyward, the sun over Mornstead appears much like the pendant heralds, suggesting Aureus' judgment is close at hand. The Hallowed Sentinels represent another sect of Aurism whose popularity is attributed to the presence and leadership of the illustrious Judge Cleric the Immaculate Lady. A discussion of Orism is incomplete without mention of the Sentinels, but theirs and clerics is a topic worthy of their own videos, which can be found in the description below. In essence, Judge Cleric, the ancient paragon who defeated a deer alongside the other two judges, swore divine allegiance to Aureus, who bestowed upon her already impressive person powerful radiant magic. In her victory, the cleric founded a military order of her most zealous and convicted followers, known as the Hallowed Sentinels, to ruthlessly destroy vestiges of the Rogar demon god's influence, and remain vigilant for signs of his return. The Hallowed Sentinels affirmed solemn oaths of subservience to cleric, and devoted themselves wholly to Aureus' light. The first centuries of their existence saw cooperation between Judge Cleric's Sentinels and the growing Church of Orion Radiance. They found a ready and common enemy in remnant Rogar forces that haunted ravaged wastes and in cultist circles who prayed to a deer in shadow. The Orion Church's influence on the hallowed Sentinels is apparent in the symbols borne by this military order. Their symbol is the Orion Cross fashioned into a sharp blade. Thorns and barbs adorn many sentinel armaments, demonstrating their firm belief in the Orion ideas of blood and penance. Over time, however, sentinel traditions gradually broke from church doctrine. They increasingly venerated Judge Cleric and elevated her to the status of God among mortals, which conflicted greatly with church monotheism. As friction continued, the Sentinels developed their own spells and incantations, which placed a sanguine emphasis on blood. The hidden lore of Bloody Aspergillum recounts that, over time the teachings of Judge Cleric gradually placed an even greater emphasis on the importance of blood and its connection to radiant magic than the Church of Orion Radiance ever had. Then, 
massacres perpetrated by agents of the church both astonished and abhorred Judge Cleric. She severed ties completely and distanced herself from the Church of Radiance, though her sentinels continued to practice their unique form of orism. Theirs is a denomination not officially condoned by a now embittered church. The Cleric's benediction ring is symbolic of the fractured trust, the schism that now separates old allies, and the sentinels in their corrupt and twisted state under Rogar influence now suffer no religion save the Immaculate Ladies. A whimsical chime rises lilting through the air around the Pilgrim's Perch and other areas of worship within Mornstead, a melancholy dirge that inspires introspection and revelation. Bells are a common motif throughout Orism, objects charged with sanctity and significance. They adorn shrines, line altars, gather among places of prayer, and can even be found attached to weapons and armor of religious zealots. Bells offer a connection to Aureus himself through his word. The ringing of chimes and iron bells is the passing of Aureus' whispers from his divine lips to mortal ears. Pilgrims and preachers keep tiny bells handy as a reminder of faith and of their Lord's blessing, which we can see in the bell staff and the Orion preacher catalyst. Bells are particularly important in the ceremony of the sacred residence, practiced by the Order of the Hallowed Sentinels. This ceremony is holy blessing through a crucible of pain and torture. Aspirants don a massive resonance bell that sits over their head and are subjected to countless hours of unimaginable agony as even the softest whisper is magnified a hundredfold within the bell and resonates thousands of times over. It's enough to drive many to madness or even death, eerily hinted in the hidden lore of the sacred resonance bell. A bell once used in the ceremony of the sacred residence, the tortured howls and screams which echoed around its interior have long since faded into silence. Those who survive are blessed indeed. Conferral of the sacred residence brings with it increased strength, vitality, and a deeper connection to God. The receivers of the sacred residence are among the most ardently zealous sentinels and among the most feared for their heaven-supported abilities. It's unclear to what extent bells hold sway within other sects of Orism, but for the Sentinels of Mornstead, they are symbolic of conviction and faith. Centuries of iteration and reformation shape Orism into its current form, dominated by the orthodox and influential Church of Orion Radiance, whose pontifical seat lies in lands far beyond the Kingdom of Mornstead. The Orion Church is a massive political organism with thousands of religious offices that, although it has long since fallen from its golden age, still wield significant power. Administration and the enforcement of Orion's divine will on the mortal realm is divided into stratified church positions, of which there are two main categories, members of the religious clergy and their counterparts within esteemed military orders. Appointments within the church stem in myriad directions like branches of a tree. The trunk that unites them is found in the first luminary. The first luminary is the utmost authority within the radiant church. They give voice to Aureus himself, and through them his will is manifest. The first luminary is the most learned, blessed, and devout of God's followers, and they control directly the canon of the church. This position was in the past based on merit, but bloated bureaucracy, hypocrisy, and corruption rampant throughout the current church ensures only the most politically cunning, whose pockets are lined with gold, assumes the title, as hinted in the lore of the radiant sorcery, Aureus Judgment. The Church of Orion Radiance has always claimed to the world at large that those appointed to the position of First Luminary are directly chosen by Aureus himself. Although, as with most matters of authority, the truth is far more mundane and predictable. Like Aureus himself, 
the first luminary is obscured by myth and largely absent from the main story. Beneath the luminary sits a council of archpriests that oversee church works and administer affairs of import. They correspond with kings and princes, secure requisitions, and coordinate the positions below them. The largest contingent within the Orian clergy are the priests, priestesses, and preachers who disseminate Orius' word far afield. Their oration stirs passion and inspires conversion to their religion. Orion priests extol their god as a divine father who will bring salvation to those deemed worthy. Only through faith and sacrifice can sinners be cleansed, their souls prepared for his embrace. The church mission offers hope in a realm of darkness where want, fear, and pain dominate the hearts of mortals. Preachers sojourn harrowing routes to proselytize barbaric cultures, root out polytheistic heresy, and enlighten the benighted masses to the one true faith. The Church of Orion Radiance can preach salvation until its orators breathe their last, but to actuate its vision, skills of a more violent nature are often required. To this end, Orius sponsors a wide array of military orders pledged to his divine will. These range from warrior priests versed in liturgy and spellcraft, knightly orders of gallant soldiers, and the seething legions of zealous peasantry. One such military order is that of the Lucent Sword. At their height, the Order of the Lucent Sword was once the most favored military order of the Church of Orion Radiance. But after a series of failed objectives led to denunciation from the church, the order lost much of its manpower and influence. Their gleaming blade symbol adorns both their ring and their shield. The location of the Lucent Sword shield is most interesting within Judge Cleric's Empyrean, suggesting remnants of the order flocked to her sentinels following their expulsion from the Orion Church. Another military order of great renown is the Holy Band of Radiant Purifiers. This small group of Orion zealots and warrior priests travel the land in an inexorable drive to wipe clean through divine light all things declared anathema to the church. Only those of demonstrable skill and unquestioning devotion ascend to the ranks of this glorified order. The Radiant Purifiers were founded by a first luminary paranoid by the growing clout and independence enjoyed by the Dark Crusaders as a check to their power. They are two sides of the same coin. The Purifiers walk in light, while the Crusaders stalk in darkness. This we hear in the hidden lore of Radiant Purifiers set, which reads, As the power and influence of the Dark Crusaders grew, so too did the wariness of the Church of Orion Radiance who in turn created the Radiant Purifiers, smaller in number than the Crusaders, but equal in zeal and ruthlessness, and kept under far stricter church control. Decorated in brilliant gold, lustrous white, and wielding divine radiant sorcery, the Purifiers embody Aureus' own luminance in stark contrast to the grim Dark Crusaders. And while Radiant Purifiers and Crusaders both serve the Church of Orion Radiance, there exists no camaraderie between these two factions. To strive in darkness, in light we walk. In light we walk. In light we walk. In light we walk. There are in this bleak world some lands shrouded in an abyss the depths of which even Aureus cannot penetrate. There are those who will not see the light, those vile abominations immune to the word of God. There are those deeds better left unsaid, but cannot be left undone. The Church of Orion Radiance casts a grim shadow, the black corners of which linger souls that suffer reprehensible evil, that tread the path of darkness to protect the light. These individuals are sneered at with contempt bear the stigma of reproach, but possess such indomitable faith and steadfast conviction that no force, mortal or immortal, will sway them from their holy duty. For threats the church cannot confront directly, 
to perform necessary and heretical acts, they must turn to the inscrutable and powerful Dark Crusaders. The Dark Crusaders are the most prolific of orders bound to the will of the church. They're notorious for spreading church and Orient teachings via whatever requisite means. There is no act too disgraceful, no charge too impious in obedience of Aureus. The Crusaders are a deeply religious order who wield darkness to serve the light. Their hearts steeled against compassion, their wills forged in iron, they are God's itinerant knights. While some of the military orders approved by the Church of Orion Radiance have charitable purposes and care for the sick and poor, the Dark Crusaders are not one of them. Blood and death follow in the wake of the Crusader. As a symbol of their order, the elaborate Dark Crusader cross colors standards, armors, weapons, and is even branded upon the bodies of those who have taken holy oaths leaving no room for misinterpretation as to their identity and a chilling reminder of their ardent zeal. Dark Crusaders occasionally garb themselves in black to mark them as servants of the Crusaders, thus making the striking of one an offense akin to striking the first luminary himself. Thus are the members of this order free to execute their tasks wherever they may be taken. The cross marks them but a Dark Crusader's rosary strengthens those souls worn by harrowing journeys. Each Crusader bears a rosary as a symbol of their faith, that what they do is in service of good, a guide to spare them from evil lurking. Brooding colors are worn in contrast to much of the church, highlighting the Dark Crusader's unorthodox measures. While much of Orism venerates vibrant hues that evoke the lightning and luminance of their divine creator, the Crusaders prefer colors that allow them to blend seamlessly with crowds and draw attention away from their bleak endeavors. Of course, superstition cloaks this mysterious order, which we hear in the lore of the Dark Oath armor tinked. An old Mornstead saying claims that one should beware the man who blackens his garb in heraldry, for his coming marks benighted days in which he will attempt to hide wickedness and blood in the shadows which envelop him. Those deemed resolute and possessed of dauntless spirit take holy vows of confirmation to join the crusade. They do so with a solemn oath on the red hand, a gesture that symbolizes the power bestowed upon them by the Imperator to judge and execute in Aureus' name. The Imperator is the highest rank one can achieve among the Dark Crusaders, and the current Imperator, Jacob, has led the order for many years. An aloof figure who sits atop a throne studded with barbs to ensure constant flow of ritualistic blood to Holy Aureus, it's likely the Imperator who is depicted here before Exactor Dunmire. The radiance of Mornstead with us. From his seat, he issues all orders and administers crusader activity from far within the aphotic sanctum. A fitting term for duties clandestine, as aphotic is defined as a region so deep no sunlight may pierce it. And indeed those who gain audience with the Imperator likely feel the oppressive gloom devoid of Horius light. Many are the peasant and noble alike who seek the fame, power and purpose found within the crusaders but the order is quite discerning. Hopefuls who wish to bear the cross are known as postulants, and they hail from across the Oathlands. Most postulants, however, fail even to be initiated as a neophyte within the military order. Initiation into the Dark Crusaders involves a secret ceremony never to be discussed with outsiders, and every new member is required to sign over all of their wealth and possessions which are then used for the good of the order as a whole. Of those who pass as neophytes, only a small percentage are possessed of the skill and fervor required to survive the initial challenges placed before them, as alluded to in the hidden lore of the neophyte armor. 
only a small percentage of Dark Crusader postulates overcome the necessary trials and are inducted into the order as neophytes, and fewer still are those who advance beyond, or even survive, this lengthy and hazardous early phase. Neophytes represent the lowliest appointment within the order who are permitted to study and train with aspirations of promotion. It is an initiate's performance as a neophyte which informs their superiors as to which of the Dark Crusader's more advanced roles would best suit their particular strengths, and thus best serve the Order as a whole. For the Dauntless, a life of service in Aureus' name lies before them. The ranks of Dark Crusaders are filled with myriad roles, each with specific abilities. The Perjure class comprises entire regiments of holy warriors. These berserkers wield bloody axes and rush headlong into the fray, sending piercing fear into the hearts of foes. They make up a sizable percentage of the Dark Crusader's fighting force, and as such are a common sight during battles and sieges, crashing into enemy lines and surging through breached walls to cut down any heretics in their path. Heavily armored, Versed in prayer, sword play and mounted combat, paladins are the Dark Crusader equivalent of an army's cavalry and are a formidable force within the Order. Paladins are a key element of the Dark Crusader's military might, with many opposing armies being thrown into disarray at the outset of a battle by the charge of a force of paladins on their fearsome war horses. Imperator Jacob sends legions of foot soldiers reinforced by paladin knights to quell disorder, to bring Aureus radiance to the lands of darkness. Then there are the vanguards. Swift, lethal, and possessing remarkable endurance, vanguards excel in their duties as scouts and advanced units, often attached to a main Dark Crusader force, typically working alone or in small groups and carrying out reconnaissance, information delivery, sabotage, and assassinations. A scrutiny of their accoutrements showcases the light weight of their armor, which affords them unencumbered movement on the battlefield to execute their charge. Another sect of righteous warriors, the Harrowers, are dauntless and convicted. They endeavor the most remote, most inhospitable environs to bring by the sword Aureus' will. As their name suggests, these individuals wade through swamps, scale mountains, plumb the depths of privity, to extricate sin, and they are perhaps the most versatile and skilled of all Dark Crusaders. This is referenced in the hidden lore of the Harrower armor set. All Dark Crusaders are considered elite representatives of their faith, such as the strictness of their selection process and the prowess of successful aspirants. But even so, very few possess the almost unnatural skill necessary to achieve the prize martial rank of Harrower. Our only look at a Harrower in action comes in the fight against Harrower Dervla in Revelation Depths. Armed with great sword and crossbow, and sustained by umbral magic, she is an unstoppable force. Her stigma highlights Dervla's intrepid prowess as she single-handedly defeats two receivers of sacred resonance. Ravagers, meanwhile, assault enemy formations directly with crushing and brute strength. Heavily armored, wielding grand swords, they quickly dissolve all resistance. As the Ravager armor hidden lore reads, Ravagers are trained to focus on physical might, being feared for their devastating strength and ability to endure pain and injury, the likes of which would kill lesser warriors. Finally, there are the Exactors prelates and preachers well-versed in law and church doctrine. They are agents who admonish through torture and castigation, sinners both within and without. No transgression is beyond an exactor's purview, no blasphemy above their notice. They draw confession from even the most stalwart prisoner through execrate measures. 
The crippling dread evoked with mere mention of an exactor heard in the lore of Dunmire's cane. Whether prisoner, king, or fellow dark crusader, many are those who have sat listening with growing apprehension to the tapping of an exactor's cane signaling the approach of its owner. Armed with holy scripture that seconds as a catalyst for radiant spells, exactors cast light on all. They pore over countless texts concerning all manner of subjects in the course of their duties, aware that knowledge is as powerful a weapon as any ever forged. As an order, the Crusaders are infamous for their barbarism, for their use of darkness in light's service. Streaks of evil done for the benefit of good stain the history of the Dark Crusaders in blood, as was catalogued in the war launched by the church against the heretical city of Agazad. The famously formidable gates of Agazad had held back hostile armies for numerous generations, the city's inhabitants boasting of their eternal endurance. Until an Agazad politician made a grievous error which brought the Dark Crusaders to those same gates. The terror and martial prowess wielded by the church's dark zealots spreads crusader infamy. Fear, more so than bloodshed, keeps rival nations cowed to Aureus will. Such was the case with the warrior shamans of Uderanger mentioned previously. And again we hear the crusaders' intolerance in the tale of atrocity culminating with the Perdam massacre. My grandfather used to tell stories about the Pardamish Crusades, and there was one about what the Dark Crusaders did to every man, woman, and child in one small village. <sighs> that left an impression. They may worship Aureus, but it's clear as day why Judge Cleric parted ways with the Church of Orion Radiance. It seems that those who walk constantly in the abyss are corrupted thusly, and the Crusaders are indeed despised by many. But, as Imperator Jacob states, darkness is not to be feared, it is a weapon, and thus to be wielded. Lo, the latest receiver of his grace. Great potential dwells within you, doubtless, for you to be chosen thusly. Perhaps the most tangible example of the Crusaders' adoption of darkness lies in their use of the umbral lamps and employment of lamp bearers. Umbral, the realm of the dead, sits imperceptibly beneath Axiom, realm of the living, and most are unaware even of its existence. Umbral is suffused with ungodly power, power that is captured within the lamps, the power to walk between realms, to reveal dark truths to skirt death and revive those beyond life's reach. The umbral lamps are condemned as cursed artifacts by the Orion Church at large, but secretly endowed upon the Dark Crusaders. The significance of umbral is revealed when it is discovered that the lamps are capable of cleansing the radiant beacons of the hallowed sentinels, divine pillars of Aureus light that have for centuries sealed the demon god Deer, but have recently succumbed and been corrupted by his Rogar iniquity. As the church takes interest in the cataclysm that consumes Mornstead and the rumors of heretical practice within the hallowed sentinels, the Dark Crusaders and their lamp bearers are charged with bringing Aureus will to this broken land. While the schism between the church and judge cleric is of long standing, she and her hallowed sentinels now pervert it did at least construct Mornstead's radiant beacons, which have prevented Adir's return for centuries. But now, they stand corrupted and on the verge of collapse. It is to these five beacons you must turn your eye. Use the Umbral Lamp to cleanse them of Adir's destructive influence, and deliver salvation to a world on the brink of perdition. But the power of Umbral comes at a terrible price. Lamp bearers are made to suffer the toll of endlessly trudging the cycle of life to death to resurrection, a painful road fraught with madness and desolation. Such is the burden of their solemn duty. 
Each venture into Umbral strips them of their humanity, their identity, their sanity. The terror endured in Umbral is intolerable. Every moment a living being spends in Umbral is inherently inimical to their very nature. The creeping dread they feel constantly building towards a dire, inevitable crescendo. Psychosis or worse is the fate of the lamp bearer among the Dark Crusaders. We hear the paladin Isaac hesitating in his duty, unsure of himself and of the sin committed by his hand. Sorry, my soul with such a heretical burden. I cannot help but feel like this path only leads me, leads all of us, further from Aureus's light, not closer to it. Exactor, there must be some other way. So you deem my guidance injudicious? No, I... And your soul of greater significance than the world entire, and all other souls upon it? No. For one whose family name bears the shame it does, Isaac, you exhibit an unfortunate tendency toward recalcitrance. I would be discontented if the hubris to which your brother succumbed was confirmed a familial sin. Look to the damnatory skin you carry, Paladin, for that is your true burden, not the umbral lamp. The burden proves too great for the Paladin, who casts aside his lamp to invite the finality of oblivion. The lamps, it would seem, have a strange will of their own. Once a bearer is no longer deemed adequate, no longer fulfills the lamp's own nefarious and obscure purpose. They are either consumed by its umbral power or abandoned at their most dire hour. The lamp's light and that of life extinguished at death's precipice. Such is the case with the various vestiges found throughout Mornstead, profound memorials that echo with the severity of the umbral lamp and shrines to the countless who have come before and failed. It would seem Imperator Jacob has a personal curiosity surrounding the Umbral Realm. It's a tantalizing and powerful weapon that employed in the service of Divine Aureus could spread the Church's influence. He charges the Exactor Dunmire, already in Mornstead to root out Judge Cleric's rumored apostasy with a secret agenda, to uncover what knowledge he can of Umbral, deduce its secrets, and document its truths. For this clandestine task, Dunmire is given the Dark Crusader's Call, a device that allows direct and unfettered access to the Imperator over vast distances. But Dunmire is himself susceptible to Umbral's hysteric influence, and the further he plumbs the depths of hidden knowledge, the more his own mind fractures under the weight of enlightenment. <sighs> <laughs> yes, yes, the murk clears ever so slowly. I must descend. Yes, the living force, walking in light, in light, so bright, but they're blind like everyone else. Can't see for the glare, can't see the light is alive. Not a single hit eye between them, but eyes in umbral. <laughs> oh yes, always and everywhere. Holding my gaze over miles and miles and years and years. She sees turn of nine. <laughs> Look upon her. But Umbral's dangers do not deter the church or their order. If the Dark Crusaders wield Umbral's ungodly power, not only can they destroy a deer and his gruesome legions of Rogar demons, but also dominate the realm of the dead and its infernal deity, the Putrid Mother, who contends with Aureus for primacy. All that would remain is divine light, Aureus' holy radiance embracing the devout and smiting the wicked. Indeed, if the Deathless One assumes their charge with fidelity, cleanses all five beacons of the sentinels, and confronts a deer in his exiled realm, then this reality manifests. The radiant ending sees lightning and holy fire rain down in a torrent upon Mornstead. Aureus' judgment cleanses the kingdom of sin and the god instated as ruling deity of all the mortal realm. 
As for the lamp bearer who acted as dutiful crusader, they are consumed in the god's wrath. For Aureus fears the umbral lamp's power and loathes all whom it has corrupted. He can take no chances, even with his chosen champion. A warrior born in darkness dies in such. So ends the tale of the god Aureus, his influential church, and the crusaders who strive in darkness to serve the light. The god of radiant magic is fickle and manipulative, sheltered behind lies to show his magnanimity. Those who seek his charity or blessing must endure pain and sacrifice as he had. Aureus' will is manifested through his humble church, his divine word brought to believers and unbelievers alike on the edge of the blade held by the dark crusaders. Theirs is a grim, thankless, and necessary burden. They perform sin to destroy it, work in shadow to cast illumination, and sojourn to the very heart of evil to excise it at the source. The red hand of holy oath stokes zeal in their hearts and condones their actions. They are the dauntless dark crusaders. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this video on Aureus, the Church of Orion Radiance, and the Dark Crusaders in Lords of the Fallen. Let me know your thoughts on the Crusaders' mission, the sects of Orism, as well as your own insights and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. I want to thank my amazing supporters over on Patreon who make all of this possible, and I couldn't do it without their fantastic support. If you'd like to become a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, head to patreon.com slash the librarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.